Uh, so we are in week three of this series called Portraits. You know, and if you've been with us, Pastor Tony kicked off this uh, series by sharing about the suffering Christ. And in Jesus' suffering, we know that our debt was paid when he died on the cross for us. And it's because of the innocent Jesus' suffering for us that we are freed from our debt and our sin. And last week, if you were with us, Pastor Susan did an amazing job and painted us this portrait of the victorious Jesus. And if you were here, we noticed that she taught us that in Jesus, we get to participate in victory, and we have to choose him. That's how we participate in the victory of Christ, is by choosing to believe in him. And it was a powerful, powerful message. If you weren't here, I would recommend going to our YouTube channel. You can find us at Crossway today, and you can look up that message that Pastor Susan did. It took her only three and a half months to write, and so put her hard work to use there uh, and give, her, give it a listen. Um, yeah, you're welcome, man. It's just fun. I like this spot. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I meant to, uh, to kick off. Pastor Tony, I know you're watching online today. You don't have any water bottles in your office because I needed one this morning, and that's usually where I go to get a water bottle. So buy some water bottles, please. Uh, Anyway, today we are continuing in this series of portraits, and today we're going to look at the portrait of the risen Christ. Now I know it's a bit early, it's not quite Easter yet, we have a couple of weeks, but I can't help but talk about the risen Christ. Amen, church? Like, like there's so much power in the risen Christ, and so just hang with me today. But our bottom line this morning says this. It says, in the risen Christ, we find life and we find purpose. In the risen Christ, we find life and we find purpose. And so this morning, I want to journey with you to a few different moments of the risen Christ, where we're going to take a look at different moments where he appeared to his disciples again. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Luke 24, and we're going to start in verse 36. And this is how it reads. It says this, As they were saying these things, he himself stood in their midst, And he said to them, peace to you. Now I want to pause because what were they saying? As they were saying these things, well, what is it they're saying? If you go back just a few verses earlier, uh, all the disciples were together and they were talking about how Jesus had appeared to Peter already. And he was sharing with them about what was going on. And so he said, I saw Jesus. He came back and, and all of this stuff. And so as they were talking about this, Jesus appears. He stood in their midst and he said, peace to you. Verse 37 says, but they were startled and they were terrified and they thought they were seeing a ghost. Why are you troubled? He asked them. And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. That is I myself. Touch me and see because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you can see that I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they were still amazed and in disbelief because of their joy, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? (laughs) Brother was hungry. So they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. He told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and he will rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses to, of these things. And look, I am sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. See, these verses, they actually tell us a lot about Jesus here in this moment. But one of the first things that I want to point out to you 
is that the risen Christ is a visible Christ. The risen Christ is visible. Jesus came back to his disciples in his human form, and he showed them who he was. And it wasn't just this good story. It wasn't just this moment where it's unbelievable, but it is truth. Jesus rose from the dead. And for you and for me, that means that the risen Christ should be visible in our lives. If you have notes, you can actually write that down, that the risen Christ is visible. And so what does it mean for the risen Christ to be visible in your life? You know, it means that our life should look very different after we encounter him. It means our lives don't look like they used to. It means that as Pastor Susan spoke last week, we have victory from our sin, that we are no longer in bondage to it. We don't have to live with shame or regret, but we get to walk in freedom from our sin. We are changed, and we're meant to be different. Jesus, the risen Jesus, is meant to be very visible in your life. And we see the visible, risen Jesus in our life when we see the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence of that in your life. When you begin to see and experience joy in your life, when we show love, when we have unbelievable peace, when we are patient, when we act with goodness and we act with gentleness, when we display self-control. That's the risen Christ visible in your life. And I often wonder, what would our workplaces look like if we started to experience and we started to show the visible risen Jesus in our life? You know, what would students, your schools look like if you started to display the risen Jesus? Let's make it more personal. Man, what would your home even look like if you started to display the risen Jesus in your house? If you started to show joy, you started to have peace with one another, if you were gentle or maybe a little more patient, if you started to show more self-control, how different would the dynamic of your house start to look if you started to live with the risen Jesus visible in your everyday life. Jesus came back and he made himself visible to his disciples. And as disciples of Jesus, is he visible in your life? Or does it look similar to those who don't know him? See, living with a visible Jesus is a fun and exciting journey. And the more that I enter into his presence each and every day, the more I get to see the evidence of him. And it doesn't mean my life is perfect. It doesn't mean that every moment I'm the greatest husband or the greatest father or the greatest pastor or the greatest even man. But it means that I have hope in the one who conquered death. Even death on a cross for me. And because of him, I have hope and freedom. And because of him, I get to experience forgiveness. And that's actually the next thing that you can write down about the risen Christ. The risen Jesus is a forgiving Jesus. If you would turn with me, we're going to flip around in a few moments. And and we're going to turn to John 20 here. And then later we'll be in John 21, so just be ready for that. But this is John 20, verse 24 through 29. But Thomas is how it starts one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands, put my fingers into the mark of the nails, put my hand in his side, I will never believe. A week later, his disciples were indoors again, and this time Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and he stood among them. And he said to them, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, he said, put your finger here, look at my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas responded to him, my Lord, my God. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. You know, it's interesting, every year, Pastor Tony and I 
uh, have a discussion about Thomas uh, at this time of year. Because this is one of the only times a year that you usually hear him. And, and you hear the name Doubting Thomas. Anybody ever heard that name? Like Doubting Thomas. And, and so what's interesting is, is he's known for this one moment in his life. He's known as Doubting Thomas because of this one time. And I often think, man... How would I feel if I was known for one moment of a lack of faith in my life? If all of a sudden it's not Pastor Joel, but hey, that's doubting Joel. You know, we use these words to define him. When I look at Jesus, I don't think Jesus defines him in that way. I think Jesus went to the cross to forgive Thomas even of his unbelief. See, faith isn't the absence of doubt. But faith keeps believing even in the midst of our doubts. Our doubts, like Thomas, it's not unforgivable. In fact, I think doubt is natural. It's a normal part of our life. But what matters more is that even in our doubt, we continue to move on and have faith. Faith that Jesus forgives us for those moments. Like he did to Thomas And later, I want you to turn to John 21, and and we see further evidence of the forgiving Jesus and the risen Jesus. This is how John 21, 15 through 17 starts. It says, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter. Now, I want to pause, man. Jesus was hungry after he came back. Did you notice that? Like, that's like twice dudes eating. I guess I'd be hungry, too, if I was gone for three days. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told them. Second time, he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep he told him. Jesus asked for a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? At this, Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? And so he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. If you know any events in Scripture, You know that Jesus was being put on trial, and Peter was there in the outer courts, and he was watching everything happening. And in that moment when Peter was asked, hey, weren't you one of the ones traveling with Jesus? Peter said, no, I don't know him. I'm not one of those that was with him. And he did this three times. Here in this scripture, in this very moment with Jesus on the beach, Jesus looks at Peter and he gives him forgiveness. He offers him the forgiveness that he's seeking. The risen Christ is a forgiven Christ. For us to live like the risen Christ, I think it starts with us being forgiven like Jesus was. You know, I'm currently part of this class that's called Essentials, and it's where I'm going through and learning some of the essentials of church planting. And uh, it started with week one talking about us, like as church planters, who are you? And I get the, the pleasure of going through this with Sean and Chrissy as they're going through this course again for the second time. Not that they failed the first time, but they said, we want to do it again. And so they're with, with us again, and... Um, The first week, as we were kind of diving into what it means to be a church planter, it started with looking at you and your heart. And one of the questions that was asked was, you know, what past hurts or or what past experiences do you have that you haven't let go of or surrendered yet? Well, what is it that, that you're holding on to in your life that you're not forgiving? And to be honest, at first I was like, you know, I'm pretty good. Thanks, guys. I don't have much to offer here. But our coursework goes two weeks long. And so as we're journaling and sitting on on these questions, I started to feel this prompting by the Holy Spirit of, 
maybe you're not as good as you thought you were. And I realized that there was this past hurt that I hadn't addressed in my life. And it was from uh, uh, my previous position at, at a church where uh, one of the pastors who served above me looked at me and told me, Joel, you're never going to be anything. Joel, you're never going to become a pastor. You're never going to do well in life. Like, you're just going to be a staff member. And it was this really deep wounding that I had from somebody that I trusted. And it was in that moment that I started to sit. I started to pray. And I had this time with the Lord where it was like, God, I know that you have forgiven me for holding on to this wound, but help me take the next step and forgive this person. I think all of us have wounds that we hold on to. All of us have things in our life and people have done things to us in our life that seem very unforgivable. But when I look at Jesus and I see this interaction that he has with Peter and he stares at him face to face, this man that just denied even knowing him in his most desperate hours and he gives him a job to do And he says, I still love you, Peter. See, I think when I look at Jesus and I see that that he can forgive Peter, I know for a fact that I can, with the strength of the Lord, forgive those who hurt me. And we're meant to let go of those hurts because Jesus forgives us for all that we do. So why can't we forgive? And when I started to realize this hurt, this, this healing that I needed, this forgiveness I needed to extend, what happened is I started to feel freedom. I started to feel this moment of release from any pain I was holding on to. I started to see a new sense of appreciation for the forgiveness Jesus gives to us. See, Jesus doesn't hold your hurts against you. He doesn't hold your sin against you but he forgives us the very moment that we ask for it with no strings attached. Church, we're meant to forgive just like we are to receive the forgiveness that Jesus offers to us. And Peter, even though he turned his back on his friend, Jesus forgave him. But not only that, but Jesus actually does something so much more powerful and he gives Peter a mission. And see, the risen Jesus is a missional Jesus. When we read through this passage here in John 21, three times Jesus gives Peter a mission to feed his lambs, to shepherd his sheep, and to feed his sheep. The risen Jesus rose for a reason. And it wasn't just for forgiveness, but it was for all of us to have a way back to God the Father. Because our sin is what separates us from him. And in Jesus, we are able to get back to God. And the words Jesus spoke to Peter, it may seem very personal for him, but Jesus, after his resurrection, actually goes to his disciples and he appears to them a final time and he gives them a final command. And you may know this verse because I've preached on it a couple of times. Pastor Tony has mentioned it a couple of times, but it's one that we can't help get away from, and it's found in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And this is what it says. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember that I am with you always to the end of the age. See, this passage is so powerful. And and if you were with us a few months ago, we had this guy by the name of Jesse Pratt with us. And he spoke about this very passage in Scripture. And he told us that Jesus, in his very final moment, before he ascended into heaven, took the time to give one final command. That's something we should pay attention to, right? And so Jesus gives us this command to go and make disciples. And so church, are we going and making disciples or are we choosing to sit and be comfortable? You know, when I think of going and making disciples, 
to me, it can feel a little uncomfortable at times. But that's okay. See, Jesus goes beyond our uncomfortability. And Jesus can do more than we ever imagined. See, when I think of a missional Jesus, and I think of us being disciples who are missional, it means that you and I have a very important job to do. The mission matters more than anything else. Because you and I have forgiveness that others can experience. You and I can have a freedom that others should know. You and I have a hope that the world needs to see because our world is broken and our world is hopeless. But Jesus is the answer. And so church, what are you going to do with the mission? What are you going to do with the command to go and make disciples? Are we just gonna continue to sit here in this place week after week? Or are we going to start and see lives transformed by the very name of Jesus? Are we going to start to offer the hope and freedom that he has given to us? Or are we just going to stay here and keep it to ourselves? See, when I look at the risen Jesus and when I look at this moment with Peter, I can't help but thank God for that time. That even in Peter's unbelief, even in his his desperate time of saying, no, I don't know you, Jesus didn't turn his back on him, but Jesus said, Peter, I still love you and you have a job to do. He used Peter in his denial and there's nothing that you've done that Jesus can't use. You know, we may feel disqualified. Like, man, I've, I've done so much in my life. There are things you don't even know about, Pastor. There, there, there's stuff that I've done, choices I've made that seem very unforgivable. Jesus went to the cross for you just like he went to the cross for me. And all of our sins, no matter what they are, are forgiven because of him. And he can use all of your hurt. He can use all of your mistakes for his own glory. And so church, in the risen Jesus, we find life and we find purpose. No, we find a life that is free from all of our sin. We find a life that is visible, that we can see that Jesus is in us. And our purpose is to tell others all about Jesus so that they too can experience life and purpose that he provides. When I think about a visible Jesus, you know, Pastor Susan earlier mentioned how We want to have baptisms on the 24th. You know, and baptism is a step of Jesus being very visible in your life. It's what we say, it's an outward, what do we say? Wow, it just blanked me. I just, it's an outward display. Thank you guys. Yeah, I'm glad. They took, they took a purpose or whatever one we just did. It's an outward display of an inward belief. Thank you. See, that's why she's on staff. Baptism is this step where we say, I belong to Jesus. Where I've accepted him, I've chosen him, and I'm choosing to walk in the forgiveness that he offers me. But it's also more than that. It's choosing to say, I'm also going to live on mission for him. I'm going to do all I can to bring others into a loving relationship with Jesus. So as we go today, I have a few questions for you. But I want to leave you with this before that. You know, let Jesus be visible in your life. Walk in the forgiveness that he offers you. And don't be afraid to extend it to others. And church, live on mission so that others can come to know the life and the purpose that you and I have in Jesus. So, As we enter into this time of discussion, I have these three questions that I want you to talk about. And these are personal questions. They're hard questions. You know, we we talk about being uncomfortable. We talk about being a community. So now's the time. Let's do it. So here are the three questions, if you don't mind putting them up there for me. But the first one is, how is Jesus visible in your life? Is Jesus visible in your home? Are you displaying the fruits of the Spirit in your life? Number two is a really tough question. 
Who are you forgiving or do you need to forgive? And the last one is, who is that one person in your life that needs to know Jesus? We all know somebody that doesn't know Jesus. So who is it? And what are you going to do this week to be on mission for him? So church, I want to pray for you, and then we're going to head into our time of discussion. If you would pray with me. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who you sent to this earth to die for us in our sins. And Lord, I pray that as we enter into this time of discussion, God, that we aren't afraid to be honest. Lord, I pray that as a church, we start to visibly live for you. God, that our life would begin to look different than those that don't know you. Lord, that we would choose you daily. And God, I'm so thankful that you offer us forgiveness through Jesus. But Lord, that forgiveness isn't just ours to hold on to, but it's a forgiveness we're meant to extend to others. So Lord, I pray in this moment that maybe we're afraid to talk about a hurt we've experienced. God, maybe we're afraid to say, I need forgiveness myself. But Lord, I pray that you would go beyond all of that. God, you would help us to be comfortable to share what's really happening in our lives. And Lord, that you would help us to start to extend forgiveness to all those around us that we need to extend forgiveness to. And God, as in a few moments we leave this place, Lord, I pray that we would leave on mission for you. Lord, that others would come to know your son, Jesus, in a very real and powerful way. God, that they would experience the hope and the freedom that we get through his life and his death and his resurrection. So Lord, I pray that you continue to move here in this place. God, that you would move in our conversations. And God, that when we leave, we would help others find, follow, be transformed by you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.